You could plug into to the electricity. If you want. I think I have enough of it. It's better. Yeah, you, you you can of course. Uh, okay, you can try it. So this is next slide. Yeah, and here you have a laser pointer. Oh. Well. If you want it. <laughs> Sorry, this is my voice. It's a bit low, so and I got a cold. So I hope you, if you cannot hear me, just so we can stop you. It's okay. yeah, great. So I'm Orit. Uh, I'm working at Red Hat in the SEV team. I currently working on the Red Hat Gateway, and I'm going to talk to you about it today. I will explain a bit what is SEV to those who don't know. Who knows here SEV? Great. So who knows why Seth is called Seth? Ah, one. Yeah. So, yeah. So it's a family of animals <laughs> in the sea. I'm not exactly sure. And that's why the Seth symbol is an octopus. So CEF, CEF is a, an open source project. It's software defined storage, which all, you all heard this name a lot. Who knows what software defined storage is? And yeah, good, some, because I'm not sure. Well, the idea is not it's just software, but it actually can fit different architectures and if it fit itself to the hardware and not the hardware to the storage. Unlike many systems that actually are only software but match specific hardware. You cannot install them everywhere. And then it is written mostly in C++. It's a distributed storage system, which is, I believe is the way to build storage because we are talking storage is increasing all the time. And like many years ago, I was in a startup who called himself Exanet because Exa was such an, like a huge amount of storage and we actually going to get there soon. I'm guessing there will be extra byte storage. Beta is quite common. It doesn't, like every this good distribution system, it doesn't have an, a Singapore failure. It was built to be massively scalable. So that means it's not for small size of nodes. It's for a big cloud. It won't perform well if you use it on two, three nodes. It's for a really large number of nodes, and if you're not planning to really be large, you should choose other systems. And because it was built for a really large number of nodes, it, you cannot expect the user to handle errors, and there will be, because when you talk about 1,000 nodes, nodes will fail, hard disk will fail, you have problems in the networks, everything gonna happen, so you need self-healing, and it fixes itself. And it allows you to have a unified storage API so you can access it using file, block, and object. Okay, a little bit of architecture. The base of Ceph is Redus, reliable, 
reliable autonomous distributed object storage. And that's actually, it, it does the replication and the distribution of the data. On top of it, we have LibRedos, which an, is an API library to access Redos directly. And it has C, C++, Java, Python. And on top of it, it's the free, the free way we access storage. So we have CephFS to access Ceph using a file system. We have RBD, which is what's commonly used in op OpenStack. It's the block storage. There are two ways to use RBD. LibRBD completely integrated into QMU and KRBD, which is the kernel driver. And what I'm going to talk to about today is the Redis Gateway, which provides a cloud object storage like S3, like Amazon S3. So a bit about Redis. So Redis is responsible for the replication. It's an object storage, but it's not like a cloud ob object storage. It doesn't have RESTful API. It's really, it's flat namespace. Objects are divided into, you have pools and objects reside in a pool. It's a strongly consistent system. And you can actually define the, define the placement algorithm depending on the topology. You can actually say that you want uh, two copies not to reside on the same rack because of, you don't want two nodes on the same rack failure. And the placement algorithm is has based to allow really fast access and it's called crash. And it's allow, uh, and actually <coughs> client of Redis actually use the lib Redis to directly access the data. There's two types of node. First one, OSD, is the storage node. It is a very smart storage node. You usually in a cluster you have large, large number of OSDs between tens and ten thousands. You, you define an OSD per disk or red group if you want to. Uh, it, clients actually get the data from the OSDs and it does all the replication and the cell filling itself. You have monitor nodes that you have small number of odd monitor nodes. The reason for odd number is because we need quorum in case of partition. And that monitor, all it does, it, it's maintain the membership of the cluster. And, and we use like a gossip protocol that it doesn't have to spread it to all the RSD because when RSD interact for monitor, they actually monitor, give them the information and the other RSD move the data all around. Client do not access the monitor directly. So, so objects are divided into pool. You can say like a pool, a pool can have different replication. You can say this pool will have three copies, this one they have two. You can have different placements for pools, different access control lists. In order to access the object to know which OSD, under the object, actually. We have what we call placement group. Placement group is a group of voice leads, and they have actually the data. So if you have three-way replication, we, we will have three OSDs leads in the placement group. And we use cross algorithm with the object name to actually find which placement group the object belongs to. And the cross algorithm actually is dynamic, and when you add nodes or you add those, this it changes the actual results in the right way. The cross is quite complex. I think we skip it. So the API libraries allows us, first of all, it allows us a single atomic object transaction, that means you can actually update metadata and attributes to an object in one operation and it will be atomic. You also can have key value storage inside an object. You have snapshots and it allows partial overwrite of existing data, a bit different from other object storage. And we have uh, something like store 
stop procedures in uh, the database, you call those radius classes, they actually allow you to give a piece of code that will run inside the OSD when the object is written to. You can also have a watch notify events on when object is changed. So a little bit of cloud of storage. Who knows Amazon S3 or you used it? Swift, OpenStack Swift. Well, I know. Those are all cloud object storage. They're also a Google, Google uh, compute storage or Google cloud storage. The API are always REST API, HTTP based. You have users in Amazon and in Swift you also have tenants. It actually is like a big user that, they, that allows sharing between data between different users. You, you authenticate to the cloud. Amazon uses the key secrets. Swift actually password. You can give access control list to objects. That means some user can write, only some user can only read. You divide the data into buckets. It's like a Swift called those containers, but they're the same. They're similar in some way to pools, but they're a bit different. I'll talk about the difference later. You have object. Objects are like something between file and block. If block is just the data, objects also have metadata and attributes, but it's still a flat namespace. You have object in a bucket. Bucket has a name, object has a name, but that's the hierarchy stuff there, and that's like file system that can go on. So you have the main example is actually Swift and Google Cloud Storage. So there's a bit example how you use it. So this looks, this is a Swift, but Swift is quite similar, different. You add Swift and version. So it's just a simple HTTP request, and uh, you use the HTTP header to pass the key. It's not simple as it, because it's a hash, but you don't, you don't put the secret in plain text. But everything goes through the HTTP protocol. So, for example, to create a bucket, you just do a put of the bucket name. You get a bucket, you use get. To delete, you delete. If you create an object, the only difference is actually you give two names, that, and we know that it's an object and not a bucket, because we have just two levels. You can copy objects, read, and delete them. So now we're going to talk why do we need a special service and cannot access Radius directly in order to implement S3 or Swift. So the, first of all, Radius Gateway is, keeps all the state inside of, of the Redis cluster. So it's completely stateless. You can actually scale it out. If you have lots of clients, you can have many Redis Gateway on the same Redis cluster. Let him finish. Yeah. And, and, and uh, all the data is kept in the radius scatter, so even if one gateway falls, you can just spin another one and it will read everything for the radius cluster when it needs to. So this is, uh, today we have a quite simple way to deploy radius cluster gateway. You just use self-deploy and you this is one line, and you can do also prepare and then activate, but it's quite basic. This one actually line actually runs free register. You know, In order to use the gateway, you also need to create a user for S3, and this will generate automatically the secret and the key that will need that in order to access the cluster. This is the example for Swift. For Swift, we have sub-user because there's a tenant, but it's quite simple. So this is like the main component of Radius Gateway. The idea is to make it as layered as possible, but like always, sometimes you need to skip layers. That's the 
though it happens. So first of all, we're just gathering, we need, we want HTTP, so we need some way to actually access Redis using HTTP. So that's the front end, it's actually implement HTTP. You have two ways. First way is using an external web server like Apache or NGINX. We have the fast HGI. You need to enable the fast HGI in the Apache and integrate with it. And then, then we have an embedded web server, a bit simpler, CWeb. And in that case, you don't need anything. You just run the gateway and you run the web server inside. We have the layer to actually translate the dialect because all in all, the different REST API are different, but they are similar. So we don't want to du duplicate code. So we have layer for each translating each dialect. And underneath the execution layer is common, and the, when you create an object, it creates almost the same for Swift or for S3. In that way, it means that you can also access object with different dialect, and create an object in S3, and actually read it with Swift. If you have users, you need the same user. Or the other way. We have a, layer, a special layer we call RDW Redis, that actually maintains the data we need in Redis. And we we'll go a bit more to detail about all the things we need, but we support really, really large objects. S3 limitation is five tera per object. So that means we need striping of the object. We need to do atomic overwrite because cloud object storage doesn't allow to write inside an object. We need to have fast access to buckets to see which objects are in the bucket. The, that means we need to index the bucket. And we, it also runs the object class, which is like sort purchases in the OSD. We have a quarter component. And we have user and quarter per user and quarter per bucket. Authentication, it's actually more complicated because Swift and S3 and Google all do different authentication, so we need to handle each one differently and to support different authentication. And because objects are large, we don't want to, we want the lead operation to be efficient, so they are done actually in the background, and for that we have the garbage collection that deletes all the metadata and the object in the background. So actually when you delete an object, the operation finish immediately, but will take time for the space to free. So we need to keep user data, bucket data, object and SELs per user. So why did we just did a web server and then translate maybe the REST API to command? Why do we need the Redis Gateway? So the main difference is that Redis limits the object size, it's a few giga. Objects are mutable, and they are not indexed inside the pool. And, one li and you don't have a CL per, per object like the cloud soils needs. So if you compare to other scales, we have really large object, few terras. They are immutable. We need to index the bucket, so listing the content of bucket would be fast. And we need all the permissions to be flexible. So first problem is large object. How would we support really, really large objects? We want that small object access will be fast. We want to have fast access to the metadata when you list content bucket or stats on an object. But we still want to keep really, really large objects. So how do we do it? It's quite so object is actually not one Redis object. It, it's several. There will always be head object. It, has, it's, it will contain all the metadata and the attributes. Some are user also. And it's like a manifest. Swift also has a manifest for its large object. It's a, and for small object, the data can be in the head up to 
half a mega. And then you have the tail. It could be one or more object, or zero actually for small object, radius object. And that's the rest of the data, the stripe pins. Usually the stripe size is four mega, but you can configure it to be larger or small. Now we have the naming. So we need to identify the object head. So it's just the bucket index, a bucket instant ID, and the object name. This is object foo. And the bucket is, ID is 123. We have a bucket ID because user can rename the bucket. So we cannot use the bucket name as an identifier file, but we use an, each bucket has a unique ID and we use that. And the tail will look quite similar. It will start with a bucket ID, but then something strange. It's a UUID, some unique ID. And then numbering means part one, part two, and so on. In order to actually list which objects are in the bucket, the bucket, we cannot just have a we need some way, something like similar to directory, a way to actually see the a list of all the objects inside this bucket. That, this is, we use the key value that Redis gives us. So inside the bucket index, we have a key map value of the object. And then that's where we can list buckets quite quickly. Because we allow a large number of objects, we need some time to shard the bucket index, and it actually be several objects sharded. Object creation, now because the object is not one Redis object, we need to think about the creation operation. So we actually need to create the head, create the tail object, how many we need, and to update the bucket index. It's quite similar to create a file. It has the same problem. When you create a file, you also need to update the directory. And in case of Redis, we don't have an atomic comparison of several different objects. But we have con need to have consistency. If we, let's say, start and create the object, uh, update the bucket index, but do not create the head, then the user can list object in the bucket and see an object that doesn't exist, but will not have the object. And in other case, if we create the head first, but not update the bucket index, then the user won't see it in when he lists the bucket, but he can actually have an object. So this is, so we do something like two-phase commit. We first create the tail of the bucket because that's something user cannot see. And if there will be some error, the garbage collection can clean it later. Then we add an entry to the bucket index, but it's not a full entry. We mark it as prepare. <coughs> then we write the head. And only after everything is complete and we know that the right head is complete, we change the object to be complete and then it's a regular object. This way we can handle all failure in each stage. Okay. The next part is, is quota. So we are talking about a distributed system. We have quota per user and quota per bucket. So that means every time a user writes an object, we need to update its quota. And could, it could be from any gateway in the cluster. And we have several. So if we each gateway would actually update the quota itself, then we need some locking. Here comes the Redis classes. So instead of actually doing update the quota every time an object written in the gateway, it's done in the OSD. So when the objects you write to the object, it runs the code, and the code updates the quota. And then we check the, when we read the quota, it's already updated. And this way, it's, it, we don't need to do any locking. And it's completely distributed and it can scale. Well, to make things a bit complicated, 
we need performance, even if. So we have like user data is accessed all the time. Every time you actually do any request, you do some authentication. That means we need to see if the user has the permission to check the key secret, if it's OK. And also, the bucket is always accessed every time you add an object or even pretty statistics. So we have a, a cache layer. Each Redis gateway has its own cache. But again, we are distributed, so we cannot, we need some way to invalidate the cache. Luckily, Redis has watch notify mechanism. That means that we, in every object, Every metadata we have in the cache, we register on it, and every time it will be updated, there will be an event, and the gateway can update it and invalidate it. So, multi site. That's so currently, we actually, multi-site is the Gero, we call, what we call the Gero application of Redis Gateway. We allow to have two different geographical zones, a region, we call it regions. But two different regions be apart, and actually you can write one and see the changes in the other for disaster recovery. We call it multi-site. So this is the current implementation. So a region is a geographical, logical, logical geographic place. So is you have the east, US east and US Europe west, for example. There are different regions because there are different Redis clusters. And in each region, we can have one or more zones. If you have, in this <coughs> example, for example, you have uh, one region that has one zone and a different region that has also one zone, and you have replication between east to west. And you can actually add a third reason. So we are, in every setup, we have one master region. This is the region that handles all the metadata. And we have in each region one master zone. This is the active zone. If you have several other zones in the same region, they will have be replicated, but they will be read-only. They will be passive. Okay. Now I'll talk about how you actually set up the setup. So you need to create a region to say if it's a master. It's all done in JSON. And you need to update this, what we call region map, and create this zone also, and update the zone map. And you need to create user for each zone, and update all the zones, and restart the gateway. That's the way it's done today. It's a bit complicated. It works, it works fine, but it's complicated, so we actually, what we're doing today, is trying to simplify everything, and make it like, more simple commands. It's work in progress, so I can't display it yet, but it will be much simpler. So today, the thing, we have the sync agent. It's an external utility. It's written in Python, and it, it does actually the synchronization between the different regions. So we have, uh, let's say, we need to sync between each one and is two. So the sync agent reads the metadata from is one, and then you see send the data, the metadata to is two. And in case of the zone, it, it's it's actually tells is two, please read the data from is one and sync for that. This is the, all that you the first time you have a full sync, and then it continues to do incremental sync all the way when you have updates. In this architecture, we can only support active-passive because of the way it was built. Anyone used the sync engine? No. So, so the sync engine 
uh, today is fine, but it only supports active passive. We actually want active active. So an external utility cannot handle it. So we'll, we are actually writing everything again inside the gateway. This hopefully will be a tech preview in the next version in Joule, but I still don't know. <laughs> So that's the problem, no active button. <coughs> so first of all, what next uh, thing we need to add? We need the multi-tenancy. A tenant is a swift as a notion of tenant. Tenant is like a big user, a super user that has, that all the user can share the buckets between if they are the same tenant. So we add multi-tenant support. We add object expiration. That means you actually can say that if we give a date, a time to an object, and after that time, the object is deleted automatically. This way you can save space and after moment to delete it. We're going to support AWS 4, it's the S3 next version. NFS. So user requested NFS on RDW which is not a great fit because RGW is object storage. It's not file system. So we, in order to implement NFS, we, we choose to use NFS Ganesha, which still will be a talk later today. And, but again, NFS Ganesha needs some API to actually talk with the gateway, and those APIs should be file-based and allow operation looks like file system. So we created a libRGW. It's a library. We could say it's similar to libRBD, so you can actually talk with the RGW directly, but it has the API that looks like file and directory <coughs> API. You can do lookup. You can do, like, UD. <laughs> it's all emulated underneath, but and this way, Ganesha can actually talk with LibRGW to, uh, to the gateway. It's one process. We, it's a library, so we link Ganesha together. And this way, you'll have NFS by using RGW. Static website, it's just with domain support. Keystone v3, OpenStack is a new version. We need to integrate, so there will be Keystone v3 support. And we're going to spot Swift large objects, which is uh, Swift as a limit of few giga, if I remember, per object. So Swift large object actually, uh, it's a way they stripped the object in order to support large objects. And we're going to support both static large objects and dynamic large objects. And we implemented multi-site. There will be a new implementation. It will be, hopefully, simpler configuration. There was um, a mail a few weeks ago showing an example. If everybody wants to look at the uh, self develop you can see the new API. It will be much simpler, no JSON. We will request to rename region to zone group because it's more appropriate. And it will have active active support because it will be inside the gateway. And that's it. Any questions? Yes. Do you have a time frame on the Keystone Retreat implementation? It will be in June. I hope so, yeah. First, yes, it's very short time, but it should be. It's in review. And Any more questions? Ah, oh, yeah, I have a... Thanks. OK, any more questions? Seth, generally, you can ask on other stuff. Seth. Could you upload me the slides, please? Ah. <laughs> Hello. 
Test with uh, for another presentation to see if the video format is okay. So a after you, uh, everything is set up for you, just quickly uh, you use on? yeah use the VGA to to test. To go ahead and test now. Test now. I'm sorry, so, I'm very <laughs> Go for it. I don't expect to have any issues, but yeah, better test it then. Uh, Oh, sweet. Thank you. Can you push it to back? Uh, well, you have to do it anyway. So, uh, it's going to be just the, what you see there is what you see. Well, it will be kind of small here. So it's it's only here. Yeah, but uh, it is uh, quite quite large range. <laughs> so okay. you will be uh, on the stage. It should uh, okay. it should uh, be a lot small. So okay. you would need something twice as big. I mean, j just to be pleasant to the eye. Thanks. No problem. Have fun Scarves for the questioners? Sorry. And uh, they are free, but uh, if you want, uh, you, can, you can give more. Oh, okay. 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 Where are the recordings? On YouTube. So if you go on YouTube, the Red Hat CC or no Red Hat Check uh, YouTube channel, you'll see you'll see the streams and the recordings after them. I will do. Thank you. I want to know where they were because I can. They were on the web. 
don't know. They are on the website, I guess. What is this? I think there is streaming. Yeah, there's white streaming. It's actually a very weird kind of stream because uh, it's, it's one video, one stream for all the rooms at the same time. Oh, really? and for example, on my mobile, I can't select through the streams. So I only see the first stream. If I want to go to another room, I can't. If I go on. the new technology with the changing the cameras? Or? Could be. Uh, it, it was like that last year too. So it's awesome. I mean, the idea is awesome. But yeah. actually, if you want to, so for example, if you want to share the video with somebody, yeah. you can't just go directly to the layout. So I never used that. So <laughs> yeah. That's weird. All right. So I'm connected to one layer. That looks better? Okay. So, uh, Louis? Louis. Louis? Okay. It's Spanish. It's Spanish. Ah, Louis. Oh, really? Oh. There's an ac oh, yeah, there's an accent like that in Spanish. Yeah, yeah. Only to my, the right. My, yeah. My, uh, my Spanish is not that great. <laughs> okay. Uh, anything you would like me to say in the introduction? Or? Just uh, still dealing with it. Hand it over to you. Oh no, just hand it over. Okay. I don't know, it looks like there's only many people. So. Uh, well, uh, the previous presentation started, uh, was uh, done earlier, so <laughs> it should have ended now. So. Okay. Uh, it, uh, wait till uh, it's, uh, 10 minutes uh, after? Uh, nine more minutes, we have nine more minutes for break, right? Another eight minutes at least for people to come in. Okay, I have to move the. Um, I'm gonna move this over here because unfortunately I can't. You can't, can't type. Um, it, it won't. It's not that long. I had the same problem yesterday. Can I lift it? So I go. Uh, what do what do you want to do? Maybe you can lift it so I don't have to be curious. Well, you can stand on your side. Uh, let's see. If there's another way of doing it. Yeah, I know.